Hey, my brothers and sisters, God bless you. Well, I am up with the sun today. The crickets are even still chirping. <laughs> the sun is trying to come out. I wanted to get with you yesterday, but I have um, just been having to spend a lot of time in prayer and with the Lord. Um, you know, sometimes, guys, our enemies, our spiritual enemies, and they're all spiritual enemies, let me tell you how they are. Um, remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And we have one that hates us. We, we truly, truly do. He, the devil hates us. But, but God, but Jesus, Yeshua. Um, you know, I've had to pray this prayer. But God, you know, these things that come against me in my family and around me, you know, they left me alone with other people. They really, truly did, guys. Um, when I was married, it was, it was there. And as I've gotten older, and as I've gotten closer to God, well, they've raised their ugly head a lot. And they use the ones I love the most. They do follow family bloodlines, guys. And... You know, I'm no expert at this because I'm walking it out myself. But we have to recognize we do have an enemy. And our enemy is not in the flesh and blood, guys. Um, you know, there was a fall in the garden. And then the fallen angels came. And they had children with the daughters of men. And... that bloodline those spirits that they birthed could not go back to God these are the Rephaim or the giants like Goliath these are not just Bible stories okay <laughs> Goliath can be a real spirit in your life that comes against you And it can use your most precious loved one. That's the power of the blood, brothers and sisters. When you don't have Christ, these things, these things would overtake you. And all you have to do is look back through your family. You know your family history, most of us do when we know our families but if you've been abandoned if you were put up for adoption you might not know your bloodline family but you already know something had to be going on or you wouldn't have been put up for adoption something was happening and to break the family apart, to break the bond between a mother and a child, which is so precious. So something has to be wrong there to begin with, brothers and sisters. Either that mother was under a lot of duress and felt that she could not give that child a good life. And nowadays, we see children being taken away because families are a mess, brothers and sisters. So if you have an intact family, fight hard. Fight hard. Fight daily. Remember you're not fighting against flesh and blood. You know, all the enemies of Israel and Judah, all of them, the Egyptians, the uh, Anak, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Amalekites. You can just go on and on and on with the names, right? The Assyrian. The Assyrian is a completely antichrist demonic spirit. They all have a different 
type of job. And those spirits of those nations that came after the Israelites, well, those spirits know our names, especially when we're Christians, especially when God has his hand on our life, and even before we know it. But these things, uh, these enemies, these spiritual enemies, well, guys, they're not um, going to just affect anybody according to heritage or race or whatever. They bother humanity. They are the dead. They are the Rephaim and they are the dead. You want to know who the dead are? That's who they are. They're the disembodied spirits of giants. Rephaim. I know many people don't know that word, but it's been covered up in the King James. It's in Isaiah. It's in Psalms one time. I believe it's in Psalm 88. That's why I like the Companion Condensed Bible because he writes out the actual translation that was in the Septuagint and the manuscripts. He writes it out so you can recognize it. Well, David fought these kind of enemies. And I got news for you. If you if you don't read David's words and his psalms, where a lot of times he is praying and he's talking about his foes and his enemies. Um, yes, sometimes he's talking about ones that are outside of him, like Saul had an evil spirit. Remember, Saul went to the witch of Endor and got possessed by an evil spirit because he completely defied an order a, uh, one that it, it's a commandment that we just cannot cross to mess around with familiar spirits and he was anointed king so you know God's people are held to a higher standard um, I told you before I was walking with the Lord, you know, I was raised in the church and everything, and I left. I knew nothing. I really knew nothing. I knew Jesus loved me. I knew Jesus went to the cross. Um, I knew God was up in heaven, and he was our creator. I mean, I just knew simple stuff that you'd learn in Bible school, Bible study school, when you're little, okay? And, you know, I left my relationship with the Lord. I was just a little girl and I got into my 20s and I got out in the world and I was trying to make it in this world that was just not deemed for me to uh, have a lot of success in and yeah though I had a career and all these things guys God wouldn't let me go past a certain point. And even when I was not walking with him in truth and reading his word and all that, he had his hand on me. And he has his hand on everyone. He knows each one inside and out. And just because it might look like total destruction, it might look very, very evil, you don't know what God's going to do with that soul. Look at Jeffrey Dahmer, guys. Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, do you get any more evil than what the acts that that man committed? Pure evil. I mean, probably too evil to even put it in a movie. And prison, getting caught, saved his soul. And saved many lives, I'm sure. I don't think he would have ever stopped. Something very demonic entered into him at a young age. And he professed his faith in Jesus Christ. And that he was accountable. Publicly on national television. And it wasn't long after that. He was murdered in prison. 
but I have no doubt that the precious blood of Jesus Christ is that powerful, guys, to save a soul like that. That has been, I'm telling you now, that, you know, cannibalism, the Philistines were cannibals, guys. Um, many that are bar barbarian historical cultures did this. Look at the Moabites and Moloch. They passed their children into the fire for sacrificial human sacrifices to Moloch. And you know, there's it's it's all the same spirit. It's the same spirit as abortion. It's the same spirit as abuse. And what do we have today, guys? I mean, can, you can't bear to listen to the truth of the news. One would have to be completely living under a rock and have no spiritual insight whatsoever from the Lord to not feel and know the days we're living in. Guys, it's like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the days of Gabeah, and then some. You know, when children are thrown in a garbage can, or flushed down a toilet, or anything like that, little newborn babies, something's wrong. And the powers that be in this, the wickedness in high places would have us believe that it is a woman's right to abort a baby. And they say that it's for the women. It's women's health care. It's all about for the woman. But let me tell you something, and this is from personal experience. If a woman that's done that, which I think they all go through it, they'll turn suicidal. They'll go into a deep, deep depression. Something happens to their spirit. And if they don't harden their hearts and their conscience about it, if God awakens them, to the conviction of what they've done. Let me tell you, those uh, supposed people for women's rights will, will just totally chew up and spit out that kind of a person. Because if you speak against abortion after you've had one and you've tried to take your life and it, it did something to you, they don't care about you. But they're all for women's rights, right? They're all for women's health care. Well, you think being suicidal from a... And it might not just be the next day, guys. This works on a woman after she's done something like that. It may not be right away. It could be down the road. And if we don't have the sanctity in our hearts... And the love in our hearts for the sanctity of life. No wonder the children are not safe. No wonder we're hearing what we're hearing. And many children are getting yanked because of drugs, um, abuse, neglect. There are so many children getting put into the foster system. They don't have enough people. And then the state ends up with these children. And that is not a good thing, brothers and sisters. We're in a mess. And these are the things that are right in front of us. And we're all seeing it every day. Everybody knows somebody who's had a family member or something lose their children. Or someone is taking care of children. Because they try to keep them in the family. But if they can't, you know, they end up going to the state. And let me tell you, the state is not good at raising children. 
So I'm going to take you to a story called Ziklag. And it's about David. It's 1 Samuel 30. And it's about David and his men and something that happened to his people where they were camped at Ziklag and the enemy came in and did utter destruction. But God. And I'm going to tell you something. We've, we will all, if we haven't already, and some of us already have, but at some point in life, we'll all usually face a ziklag. And I can tell you that in these days, this message is so important because we have to keep the right mindset of what is God, who is God, and what's what, guys. Because as things progress, and they are, brothers and sisters, we are getting very near to the time that our Lord and Savior is going to return. And this world is getting turned upside down. It is just a mess. And the powers that be, and even the people, are getting more and more debased, let's just say, and wicked and dark. You know, the Lord was putting on my heart, you know, they keep talking about the solar minimum, the solar minimum. Well, what does that mean spiritually? If you stop and think about a solar minimum spiritually, what is that? Ah. Think about a spiritually... spiritual event of a solar minimum it means the world's getting pretty dark the light of the sun and who is the sun who is the sun of righteousness who is the sun well it's Jesus Christ the one that went to the cross the one that took all sin you know, this flesh is going into the grave. It's so corrupt. This is the vehicle. This is the... Oh, let's just say it's the, the grip that evil spirits get a hold of. It's the flesh, man. The flesh. This is why. There is no good thing in the flesh. It's corrupt, guys. It's corrupt. It's like it has a terminal virus. And to save our spiritual man, Jesus Christ came. Because these spirits that attach themselves to the flesh, you know, they have a right, a legal right. You know, Satan is a legalist. I don't know why people don't want to believe that. He operates by legal rights. Can you now see why we have to be under grace and the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Because if you want to go by a legalist flesh law mentality, we'll die with our flesh. The spirit man will die with the flesh. Satan has a legal right to do the things he's been doing and is doing. I hope we can all wrap our minds around that. That Satan is in the courtroom. Satan is the prosecutor over there. Making things up. Embellishing. Telling the truth too. He's going to make sure that everybody will say, hang them high. It's the truth judgmental all that you know 
That was the most humbling thing when the Lord started showing me my own flaws. It shuts your mouth. It does. It shuts your mouth about what you think someone else is doing or isn't doing. When we're all, you know, being influenced daily by things that are very dark. And there's only one way to overcome it, and that's to take the heart of Jesus, and it's to take his blood and accept what he did on the cross. And then you're going to have a recovery of your leg. So just, you know, think about your flesh. It's, it's, it's death. You're not taking this flesh body with you when you go. I know all, the, all those that believe in the rapture, they don't understand when they think about a pre-tribulation rapture. That they don't understand that the gathering together and all flesh shall be changed at the last trumpet. At the last trumpet. To meet the Lord in the air. That is at the last trumpet. But people go home every day, guys. And you'll go into a funeral home and either they've been cremated or they're in the casket. They're going home every day. They don't take that they don't take that flesh body with them. When Jesus comes, it is going to be nothing is going to be able to withstand that. It's going to dissolve. You know, something has transformed in a person that is of God and being used as his very elect in those last days. Something's already transformed before that last trumpet. You know, think about all these people suffering fires and floods and earthquakes and destructive storms. They are having a ziklek. You can have a spiritual ziklek. So, I'm going to get on into this. And um, this is victory from the ashes, guys. Because this story, this account of what happened here is <clears throat> pretty amazing with the power of God to recover all that's lost. And, you know, what's in this physical life isn't truly ours. Our children are not even ours, guys. They belong to the Lord. Even if we gave birth to them, we were put over them to oversee, to raise them up. They're not ours in that fullness as they are. They are God's. They belong to him. So, Ziklag is even where David was when he got news that Saul was dead. That, that this spirit of Saul, this evil spirit, David knew he was dealing with something spiritual. He would play the harp. And that's the only time Saul would be calm, not murderous. Saul was seeking David's life. You know, David had a lot of physical enemies in the flesh that were possessed. His own son, Absalom. Saul, he had to run from Saul. He had all kinds of enemies. Guys, um, David, if you really read about the life of David, he had curses on his family. And he would go out here and fight these real ref am. I mean, that's what Goliath was. He was a ref am. He was dealing with them face to face in the physical. Today, they're spiritual for us. Everything shifted. You know, everybody's um, all freaked out about lifting of the veil and 
what's, you know, all this other stuff. Guys, you're the bride. I hope you are. You're supposed to already be behind the veil. You're supposed to be already entered into the Holy of Holies. You're supposed to be already operating supernatural. The uncovering. You know, when the veil gets lifted, uh, what that's the wedding ceremony. A, a, a union with Jesus Christ like never before. I do believe. I mean, everybody wants to talk about the fallen, the fallen angels. The fallen angels are coming. The fallen angels are going to appear. And, da, 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 da. and the enemy, the enemy, the enemy. Excuse me. Are we this naive that we don't understand that this is a God's war? And God is not going to allow all this kingdom of darkness to be operating right out here in the in the open without his uh, angels fighting and warring. He's even in control of the locust army. God's on the throne. It's power. There will be. You have the face of your angel. God has a guardian angels protecting us also that we can't see. That's his word. We have the face of our angel. No, you do not worship an angel. You worship your Lord, your God. But he is not going to just leave you standing like a little two-year-old in the middle of a violent, dangerous neighborhood without the Holy Spirit and, and, and his protective angels that are warring this fight. These angels have been warring this fight. This fight's going to come to the earth. So if it's a spiritual war coming to the earth, uh, gee, it's not all on us, little physical flesh human beings. It's power from on high. Remember when uh, God, the Lord told, told John in Revelation 10 to eat the little book? And he told him, you're going to have to prophesy before nations and kings and many people again. It didn't make John very happy. Ah, oh, but see, we're, we're forgetting something that Jesus said. Blessed are those that believe and have not seen. So, we believe in faith. Faith is a big thing. You know? Yes, those people would come to Jesus in faith when he walked this earth. And he would say, uh, you know, never have I seen such faith in is all Israel. And he was talking to, a, to somebody who was not even of the Israelite heritage. And he didn't even come for the Gentiles at that time. He was coming for the lost house of Israel. But he did not ignore people that were maybe not even of the heritage that he came to save. Um, he didn't ignore those people. And then he says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. Your faith has made you whole. And they were seeing him in the, in the, the flesh, guys. Uh, look at the Old Testament, you know, they would have an encounter. Angels would come to them. Um, the burning bush for, and the voice of God to Moses. I mean, they had physical events happen. Daniel, Gabriel came to Daniel. John and Paul 
you know, Paul never uh, had a physical encounter with Jesus Christ, but he had a spiritual encounter, and he was taken up to the third heaven. He got to see things that he couldn't even write. He couldn't even tell other people. In heaven. See, this is where someone would be eternally damned if they turned away from that. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Rejecting. When you had a taste and you've been in front of the Lord, whether in the spirit or in the physical sense. Jesus said, you can blaspheme the Son of Man, you can blaspheme God, but don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. There's no hope for you then. So those that, you know, were blaspheming Jesus in the flesh... That wasn't the, the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is to have tasted, supernaturally been just had it poured out to you and given to you, and then you go back to the world. You leave your faith. So Ziklag. <clears throat> is a victory out of the ashes and I'm telling you guys the, this world is going up in smoke there is no one getting out alive the flesh is so corrupted guys it is so getting so dark that this world is, you know, this world is getting so bad. God's got to do something soon. Think of the little children, guys. The little children. You know, Jesus said he was on his way to the cross and the women were beating their chest and mourning and lamenting, weeping and howling. And he stopped on his way to the cross and he looked at them and he said, Weep for yourselves, daughters of Jerusalem, for there will come a day when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and to the paps that never gave suck. He's talking about, Blessed are women who never, ever gave birth. He's not just talking about a babe. And then he said later on, Woe to them that are with child and give suck in those days. What days? How about the days we're in right now? <clears throat> I have to say, and as a mother, and what I've had to experience and watch my son go through and to deal with that, um, I get that. I get it. And what hurts my heart is that many don't understand what is happening in this world spiritually. And it hurts my heart because you know, many are going to and are experiencing this. It doesn't discriminate. I'm seeing it with other believers. I'm seeing it with those that are not believers. So if you have a family and you have children... Please cover them. Continue to cover them if you've been covering them. Because they need it. And, you know, don't be surprised when God will use 
some young people and put his hand on them as his people, his soldiers. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, <clears throat> that's a blessed thing. So check yourself because you don't want to get a crack in your armor and slip up because whatever whatever you are especially if you're a mother now okay now let me tell you mom ain't happy nobody's happy i'm i know this and um ladies we set the spiritual tone over a lot of things in our households and um you know a lot of women are are the spiritual The one hearing from God in their families, even if they're married. The man should be the spiritual head of the household. And when a man is um, walking, a, a true man of the Lord, and really walking with the Lord, guys, they have a high, high calling. They have to love their wife and their family as Jesus loved the church. And so, you know, if your husband is a believer and he's walking with the Lord, and that doesn't mean he's perfect, <clears throat> but if he truly has faith, if he's really serving Christ, you know, the Lord will anoint that. But I have noticed something that <clears throat> it's been going on for quite a while. It seems like the women, the women <clears throat> are like the spiritual ones in the family. And they're covering everybody. Just be careful, guys, because, you know, then, of course, the enemy wants to just take down your household. So, if he can, just like Eve, remember, Satan went after Eve, guys. <laughs> He went after Eve. We can hear that enemy's voice and we, we cannot react to it. You know, Satan used to do this to me all the time. It doesn't work anymore, so he stopped. But something would be said or done. And he'd be like, what you gonna do? What? Did you hear that? What? What? Are you going to put up with that? Always trying to get you to react. To come out of your peace. See, that happens when we don't realize what we're dealing with here. So, I'm going to pause here for just a second. I know I've been rambling and I'm going to get into this. So, 1 Samuel 30, if you would, please follow along. Get your Bibles. There is something to be said about when you physically read the Word for yourself. Either you can follow along on here, but I'm telling you, there's something really happening, guys, when I'm in a paper or a, bi a, a physical Bible, and I'm turning the pages and I'm reading. I'm telling you, something's happening. Something's happening. Something's moving. Let me tell you something. <laughs> God is moving right now. He wants to know, are we listening? Are we being willing vessels? It doesn't mean you don't have any problems. Your world could be burning up around you. It could look like death and destruction all around you. That's when he moves the most, okay? Hold on just a moment. Okay, I am back. I had to get some more coffee. Some good hot coffee. All right. We're going to get into this. This is 1 Samuel, chapter 30. Read along with me, please. Please. Dig deep, guys. Dig deep. It's paying off. It's going to bring you so close to the Lord in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit. Oh, it is. The Lord is moving. Grab onto it. All right. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites 
had invi- invaded the South and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag. Wow, Ziklag is said thir- three times and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Three times. We're going to we're going to dig into this. I'm going to go down to verse 4 and had taken the women captive that were therein. They slew not any, so they didn't kill anybody. They just kidnapped them, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. They kidnapped them all, brothers and sisters, and burnt everything to the ground. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul, the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Guys, I'm going to pause here because there is a lot in this. Yes, it is telling you something significant here. This is utter destruction. This is utter loss. I mean, can you imagine coming home? Coming home. Especially you men. You brothers. But even even sisters, okay? But these were the men. The women were kidnapped with the children. Could you just imagine coming home from being off away from the house and working even serving in God's army and being gone for a few days and come back and your 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 whole community is burnt to the ground and all the women and children have been carried away kidnapped and you have nothing left but burning rubble, ashes. That's what David came back to. This was Ziklag. What does Ziklag mean? I mean, if it mentions it three times in one verse, we should put our little spiritual radar on, okay? Ziklag means winding, guys. It is a winding. Think of a winding road. It's not a straight path. It can also mean an outflowing from a mount of a mountain. You know, like think of a windy, snaky. <laughs> road going around the mountains. Just think about that. But it also can mean an outflowing of a fountain. Think about that. So, that's the thing about God's Word. It can have a positive and a negative connotation. And if you don't have your spirit in check, if you're walking in fear, if you're seeing the dark and everything, you're going to miss the victory, guys. Because it's out of these persecutions. It's out of these huh, tragedies even that God will do the biggest things. I mean, guys, it's darkest before the dawn. Look at the winter time. Something as simple as that. You know, think about it with spiritually. In the winter time, everything looks dead. It looks dead. The trees don't give any leaves. The leaves have all fallen off. I mean, if you were ignorant and you didn't know anything about spring, I mean, you know spring is coming. That's just part of, you know, your experience of growing up. You're like, oh, I can't wait for the spring and the flowers and everything. But what if you never saw spring? You would never know that those trees are going to bud and that little beautiful flowers are going to start popping up out of the ground and all this grass is going to start turning green 
you know, you would be like, oh, cut those trees down, they're dead, you know. See, this is what happens, guys, when we get dark tunnel vision, when we're always looking at the enemy, when all we pay attention is to the negative. We'll think that winter is permanent. We will think that there is no spring. Oh, but we say we are Christians and we know that God is the God of the living, of the resurrected, the God of all living, whether it be plant life, animal life, insects, and God forbid human life. And he's the God of the eternal life. You know, Ecclesiastes says, uh, we got it backwards. Uh, you are to rejoice at a death and cry at a birth. Yeah, you grieve. We grieve because we've lost them. But you know, when a soul goes home to God, that's a joyous thing. Their race is over. Their suffering in this flesh life is over. That's hard because we, we, we want to, we get back into this mentality that death is permanent that death of the flesh is all there is, you know, um, and we forget that we serve the living God. Not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. What are the dead? The Rephaim are the dead, brothers and sisters. It's what plagues this flesh. It's the evil spirits. Oh, no wonder they don't want you to read the true rendition of Isaiah. No wonder it just says the dead. And that makes you think it's everybody you've got a judgment against. Oh, they're not believing in Christ right now, so they're the dead. No, I got news for you. If they're breathing, if they have light, if they are taking a breath, and uh, they're alive, well, who's giving them that life? Oh, it's our Creator. And we don't get to know what happens when someone's passing away we don't get to know what happens to that spirit we don't get to know do you know do you know why i mean oh my goodness brothers and sisters you have start paying attention have you noticed in the news about people being taken to the funeral home to be embalmed and all of a sudden they find out they're still alive oh have you heard these accounts on the on the real news lately <laughs> it's been happening. Uh, I think, wait, where is it at? Over in the Philippines or something. Uh, this little two-year-old little girl passed away. They were at her funeral. Um, you know, they do things differently there. Thank God they hadn't embalmed her. But she woke up at her own funeral. Hello? We serve an awesome God. So this is winding. Well, you know, it's not a straight path, guys. It's something that's, uh, just think of a winding brook. A torch, you know, we, we know that about the tortuous serpent. It's winding. It's just, think about it. The enemy has come in and ravaged David and his men's lives and everything. I mean, hey, your house burns down, you can replace that. You you know, the Lord will give you somewhere else to go. Sometimes he has to move us. Um, he doesn't want us in that geographical location. Um, sometimes the Lord will allow something to happen so that we'll see his hand. I, you know, I'll never forget when my dad was laying there and had been in a car accident. And he was severely injured. And he ended up having to have surgery. And he died on the table. And um, got put in intensive care. I got called down there. They said he wasn't going to make it. That I needed to get down there. Um, you know, I get down there and he is having a conversation he couldn't speak very loud, but he was turning his head and he was having a conversation with someone that wasn't there. And 
and you know I took care of a lot of dying people I watched the process of death in my career in my very early career because when I first got out of uh, school that's what I did I worked with the with people that were terminally ill or dying and at home um, you see these things you'll see souls hang on till they can give a message to somebody or they're just not gonna go until this person shows up and that you can smell the death coming out of them I, I've just seen amazing things guys and um, you know I I can't tell you how many times people said they were having an encounter you could tell something was happening to them they were having some kind of encounter they were seeing someone or something amazing so my dad's whispering to somebody with his head turned. He couldn't even open his eyes. And I said, Daddy, who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? And he goes, don't you see him? See who, honey? The angels. <laughs> you know, I thought for sure this was it. He was having some kind of encounter. You know, to this day, he doesn't remember it. But I'll never forget it. And so, you know, I wasn't prepared to lose my dad at that time. I mean, he was my world, the closest human being to me. The one that I knew just loved me so unconditionally in this life. And, um, you know, I, I started having some real spiritual hand touch of God's hand on my life. No, I wasn't reading the Bible, brothers and sisters. No, I wasn't doing everything the way the church would tell you to do it. But I have no doubt God's hand was on me to lead me to where I am this very minute. God doesn't raise us up all the same, guys. So, Ziklag. Winding. This is not a straight path. This is something going around you know you're going around a mountain you're going around a winding brook you know you know a fountain this is a victory in the ashes you know so on the third day they had come to Ziklag and the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire look at this word Amalekites these are some enemies of Israel now, these same spirits come against us to this day. Now, who are they? All right, well, it means people of lapping. Um, they're the dweller of the valley, brothers and sisters. That is the truest meaning of the name. Um, when you look at the word Amalok in the Hebrew, the root word, it means a dweller in the valley. Even the valley of the shadow of death. This is your enemy in the valley. So when you're in the valley, well, guys, you're going to have some Amalekite, Amalekite spirits. This is who comes against us to burn, us, burn our lives out, to destroy, to kidnap. Think about this in the spiritual sense. David experienced this physically. We go through this stuff spiritually, and we can go through things spirit physically, guys. But it's all about the spiritual. I'm sorry, but many mothers and fathers have had their children, their adult children, and, you know, kidnapped by drugs, alcohol, some have been violated, molested, and it seems like they're gone in the head. They're, they've lost their minds. Because the enemy did something by design. And that's when we, that is when we, um, That is when we have to really understand what's happening. I 
I want you to think about something in Ziklag where they were experiencing this and they were being attacked by the enemy in the valley, even the valley of the shadow of death. These dwellers of the valley. You know, they these guys, these Amalekites, they were descendants of Esau. They were the grandson of Esau. Nothing new under the sun. But I want to take you back to this word Ziklag. You know, just think of uh, right, here, right here what they're experiencing. They're experiencing the enemy, Satan, coming in like a flood against them. Do, I mean, you you talk about, do you ever have, can you just like see sometimes, there's some days when everything starts, you don't just get one thing of bad news, you might get another and another, and you're like, whoa, what is happening? It's like, is it going to stop today? You know, the enemy's coming against you like a flood brothers and sisters, and this is what he does to the bride of Christ. We read it in Revelation 12. He sends a flood after the woman. But what does God say? Well, God says in Isaiah 59, 19, the enemy comes in like a flood and the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You know what that means? Drive him out. Chase him away. Cause him to flee. The Lord will send his spirit and he'll confine it like a stream of wind of the Holy Spirit of the living God, Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, God Almighty. And it will impel and drive and force and urge the enemy out. That's what that means. Oh, but there's a key to this. Remember this. Remember this. We talk about it all the time. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he must flee. See, we can't just resist. We have to submit to God. We have to go down on our knees and say, Lord, your will be done. Help me to reconcile with your will. Praise him in that storm. Praise him. Call upon his power and his holy name. Don't react the way the devil would have you to react. Don't go take it out on someone else. Don't go kick the dog. Don't start screaming at everybody because your life is falling apart or you're having a bad, bad, bad day. And I'm talking a bad, bad day. I'm not just talking about breaking the nail, dropping a glass, dropping a pitcher of water or something. You know what I'm saying? Making a mess or something. Or, you know, I'm talking about when you're really under attack. You know, we can't lose our peace at all these days because the enemy is going to laugh in your face. Then we're not submitting ourselves. We're not resisting him. And he doesn't have to flee then. But God wants to drive Satan away from you. And this is exactly what David did here. The people... The, look, can you just imagine the grief that these guys were feeling when they came and saw all their stuff burnt to the ground and their children and their wives kidnapped by these enemy in the valley of shadow of death? Ah, oh, Psalm 23 means a lot, doesn't it, when you read it this way? These dwellers of the valley are garments of treachery, deceit, and pillage. That's their garments. What's our garment? Oh, well, 
flesh is your garment, but we're to put on ah, a new garment, right? That's the old man. That's the flesh carnal man. We are to be dying to that every day and giving our hearts to Christ and taking his heart, which he gives us a garment. Of, we have to wear the garment of praise, the robe of righteousness, because he's our righteousness. It's applied by the blood of Jesus. Not your worthiness, not my worthiness, his worthiness. He's doing something. So these are defiled garments, okay? These are beings that are completely defiled flesh. They have murder, hatred, violence. These are violent men. They took their wives and their children captive. They carried them away. Uh oh Well, isn't that what your adversary, this the devil, desires to do? Yeah, he is a kidnapper. He's a bully and a kidnapper. Uh, I'm sorry. And then we get Stockholm Syndrome with him. We don't get it. This is what Christ warned us about. Of about the message against our adversary. This is the adversary. This is what the adversary desires to do. To kill, steal, and destroy. David's under it. These, you know, then his own people were grieved in their souls and spoke of killing David. Get it? The spirit then came over the men and blamed David and wanted to kill him. What did David do? Did David stand up and say, curse you all? Uh, did David stand up and say, what do you mean stone me? Did David defend himself in any way to his own men who were grieving? You know, I'm sorry, but I've, I've experienced this. I've experienced people that are in such grief and they have cursed at me, said hateful things to me, threatened me, and I knew in my spirit, don't, don't react to this. This is a broken, a broken spirit. This is grief talking. This is despair talking. Do not take this personal. You gotta fight for people when they're in that position, guys. You gotta fight. You don't fight with them. You gotta fight for them. So what did David do? I mean, David was even that David wasn't in, it wasn't that everybody else's wives and children got took. It was Dave's David's wife and children too. He was grieving too. So what did he do? He went and encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He drew nigh to God. What does the Lord say? Jesus says, draw nigh to me. I will draw nigh to you. Oh, but you know what, guys? He comes leaping and bounding towards us when we draw nigh to him. We just take a few steps and he is there. So just as we can open the door and Jesus draw nigh to us, the same principle, the same Legalistic law is going to happen when we open the door for Satan. And he's going to get in any crack he possibly can, brothers and sisters. And he is so, he does it through hurting us, offending us, pushing the button. And who is better to do that with than your family? Those that you're closest to, you know, guys, I'm sorry, but you want to know who we really are? It's who we are when that door is closed and we're behind the walls of our own home. The Lord revealed that to me a long time ago. That's who we really are. You know, the world out there is full of offenses. It'll chew you up and spit you out. But there's no one that can push your buttons 
and you let your hair down in your own house and you won't even realize you're doing it till the Lord brings it to your attention I'm I'm serious guys I'm serious you all of a sudden start to hear your own tone of voice how you're talking to your family you all of a sudden see yourself doing something okay okay like this like have you ever had someone record you and you didn't know it and then you heard it or watched it and you're like wow I didn't know I sounded like that. Wow, I didn't know that that's how that came out. And you're kind of ashamed or you're kind of like taken back that you're seeing yourself through another's eyes. It's like you're getting an introspective view of yourself from how someone else would, how you appeared on the film why do you think people are actresses and actors and they're not being their true selves what does an actor mean it means hypocrite okay you're not being your true self you're playing a part let us be like David in this situation let us go seek to encourage ourselves in the Lord our God. Now I know this is easier said than done. I mean, I know. Can you just imagine your own child standing in front of you, cussing you out, calling you every name in the book, and it's coming from an evil spirit? But that's your child, and you want, you know, you're like, what? How dare you disrespect me in my own house after I've done this and this and that? Hey, I've fallen into this trap. And that's what the devil wants you to do. Now, I'm not saying if you've got children that you're raising, you got to correct your children. Okay? You raise them up in the way to go, and they'll never forget it. They'll go back to it. Even if, they, even if they're like the prodigal son, they're going to come back. I blew it, guys. Okay, I blew it. I blew it. You know, I let things... You know, nobody's a perfect parent. Nobody. We all have made mistakes and said the wrong thing at the wrong time. But guys, I did other things. I was playing with darkness and did not even know it and opening doors. And, that you know, it, oh, I cringe. You know, the things we do in ignorance. And the devil would like to have you ignorant so you keep on doing them. You know, that's all I know. So, David. David goes up talks to the Lord. He He's encouraging himself. You know, that's the Psalms, guys. I mean, read the Psalms. He's pouring his heart out. He even prophesied of Christ on the cross. I mean, you think David didn't go through some things internally? David had internal enemies. He had a lust problem. He had a murderous heart. He murdered Uriah to cover up his affair with Bathsheba. I mean... His son, he had incest in his house. He had murder in his house. His one son killed his other son because his one son raped their sister. I mean, come on, guys. Let's stop acting like, oh, the Bible just is all so perfect and we're all so squeaky clean and we're all just this. And, you know, no wonder the world can't stand us and doesn't want nothing to do with what they call religious nuts they see us as hypocrites we're not being realistic look at David's life let's be real David didn't get crowned king and everything just went wonderful for him and he had all this money and all this perfect family that's what I read to you in Psalm 144 it's the enemy the Lord's over us the Rephaim <laughs> the the ones that are running the show that are key of the kingdom of darkness they're the ones that want to say look at our children they're so perfect you know they did all this right they've got ex they've got you know wealth and success and you know and here we are the rest of us out in the world we're just fighting to make sure that our children are safe We can't even send them to school in peace without with, with peace of mind. We don't know what they're getting subjected to by their peers, and then they're not physically safe. 
because of violence. Oh, but the elite, oh, you know. And then we look at them and say, oh, we want to be like them. No, you don't. Because it's all going to get turned around, brothers and sisters. That's what the revelation's all about. That's what the tribulation's all about. That is what it's all about. The kingdom of darkness is going down. Yeah, it's all got to come together so he can hit it with one nail. Christ returning. He's going to hit them in the head, take them all down at one time. Gather them all together into one place. Okay, I got to go plug in. I'm, my battery is dying. So, give me just one sec. I'll be right back. And we're going to finish this. Because I know I've been here longer than I thought I would be. Okay, sorry about that. So, David here. Just think about it. Now, David did something so amazing here. Um, I want you to put yourself in David's shoes. I want you to really put yourself in his shoes. First of all, he comes back. And all the women and children have been taken captive. They've been kidnapped. Everything they own is burnt. His own men are so grieved... They're screaming at him and threatening to kill him. Now, pause right there. Can you just imagine yourself in David's shoes? Oh, how many of us would go, Stone me, my wife and children are gone too. You know, you see what I'm saying? Oh, no, he didn't do that. Oh, but he could have also took a, a spirit of vengeance and said, No, we're going to go and get, you know, kill these Amalekites. We're going to go kill him. You know, he could have reacted in vengeance. But no, no, he did not do either one of those things. Now, see, the flesh would have us do these things. Oh, let us catch this in ourselves, guys. Let us catch this in ourselves. I've learned much, much by reading about David. I am no David. I am no king of anything, okay? I'm a king of humility of being a king of the wretches that's what i am but i'm no king david i've not been anointed king by god i am his anointed of one of his saved by the blood of christ that's it okay i'm not no king david but i can learn i can feel his pain i can see how he had blood on his hands and how he it humbled him he knew he deserved death he knew that he had fallen he knew he had internal enemies. See, a lot of times we read the Psalms and we see, oh, this is that, and this is that person, and this is that person, and David's doing this against that person. No, David a lot of times was talking about his internal enemies, the one, that spirit that rose up in him to kill Uriah, the one that rose up in him that he peeped in on Bathsheba and is a peeping Tom perverted, you know, and just because he was king, he could call her to him. She couldn't deny the king. Oh, come on, guys. Let's be real. Let's look at ourselves behind our own four walls today. Okay, let's not, let's not pretend we're these people that who we are and that face we put on when we go out to the grocery store or we go out to talk to somebody or something. Okay, let's talk about who you are when you ain't brushed your teeth, you ain't brushed your hair, um, you look like a house hag or... Or you could even be like, your hair all messed up, guys, and you look like a crazy man. I mean, come on. Let's, let's, let's be real. And somebody in your family says something and you don't like it. Okay, let's just be real today. Because God is the God of the real. He knows everything. He knows who we are behind closed doors. Okay? You know, I, I used to listen to Joyce Meyer back in the day. And, um... I always remembered this one account she would give. And she would talk about being home with her children. And they're out of control. And they're not listening. And she's getting frustrated. And she's screaming at them. And yelling at them to do this. And stop this. And, you know, pick this up. Do this. Do that. You know. And she's not having a good day as a mother. Right? And her doorbell rings. And it was her pastor. And she's like, oh, all of a sudden you just... Open the door. You know, you're like, oh, pastor. You know, you change your whole attitude. Same thing we would do if Jesus was at the door, right? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know? But Jesus knows 
who we are behind this closed door. He knows when we're tired and grumpy and what we'd say and what we do and who we, whose head we bite off. And he even knows what we contemplate in our hearts. Let's not act like one is above the other. Uh-uh, brothers and sisters. No, 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 no. No. The truth is we're all wretches. We've all had murder in our hearts. We've all done things, all said things. We all deserve death. Just the way it is. Because there is nothing good that dwells in this flesh. Okay? That's all I know. I am not perfect. If you're looking for perfection, go to some other channel because you're not going to get it here. I'm talking real to you. Okay? <laughs> and beware of anybody who's not in that humility. I'm sorry. Oh, the, you know, the high priest, oh, it's all bow to him, kiss his hand, and, you know, act like he doesn't put his pants on one leg at a time. You know what? They should just put a picture of the Pope on the John. There you go. He's a man. He's not God. He's not Jesus. <laughs> so, what is it when you put man before God? Well, it becomes an idol to you. Sorry, it could be anything, anybody, anything. All right, so David goes and encourages himself in the Lord. And David said to Abathar, the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. Yeah, he had to put on his priestly garments, guys. You know, this was before salvation, where we can just enter boldly in by the blood of Christ, okay? No, they had to go through ceremony and do things properly. Thank you, Jesus. See what Jesus did for us? And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. See, David told him. Yeah, he went to him. Because if David would have went on his own, guys, it wouldn't have turned out this way. I, I, I can guarantee you, if David had not humbled himself and encouraged him, himself in the Lord and went before God and, and consulted God, what should I do in this situation? It wouldn't have came out this way. So David went and he and the 600 men. Now, 600 means warfare, guys. So this is war. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. Okay. So this brook of the Besor, this means the brook of cheerfulness. The root word of this word, besor, means good news, good tidings. To receive good news and tidings that are announced. Joyful message to be published. Guys, this is the gospel. This is, this is the power that we can go right boldly into the throne of grace. By the blood of Jesus and go in and say, Lord, what do I do? The devil would have us react, right? Okay. He would. Knee-jerk reaction. That's the, what the world's all about, isn't it? And look, it's getting worse and worse and darker and darker. No, let's not be like the world, guys. Now, just notice this, too. So, David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor. So, I just told you what that means. Where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men. So, 200 men didn't go. They stayed behind. He and 400 men, for the 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook be sore. Guys, they were so faint, so wore out, so devastated. Look, they'd been out. They were not home. They were doing, I believe, if you go back to cha chapter 29, I believe they were like out doing another battle. And they came back, and, you know, they were, can you just imagine, you come home, you want to relax, you want to be, you want to spend time with your family, you want a good meal, 
You know, you want to take a good hot bath or shower. You know, you want to relax. No, they came home and everything was gone. That had to be devastating. So 200 of them just were so faint. They could not go over the brook of cheerfulness. You know, guys, sometimes that's where we are. We don't know it, but we're too faint. You know, even Elijah got despaired. Even Elijah got depressed. He did, but God sent an angel to strengthen him, did he not? Yes, he did. God's going to do that for us in the spiritual, in the heart. He's going to send his spirit. He's going to rejuvenate us. Let us, this is the power of the gospel. This is the power of the truth, of the good news and the good tidings. But there were 200 that were just too, I'm, I, we've all been at that point where we're just too, we cannot go on another second. So 200 stayed back because they were faint. Are they going to be, are they looked at any less in God's eyes, in David's eyes for this? Well, let's find out. Okay. Oh, so these 400 and they leave and they leave the 200 at the brook. And he says, and they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of cake and figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. So they're finding this guy out in the field and they treat him well, but they know there's something, you know, he knows something, right? And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me, because three days ago I fell sick. Yeah, his own, this is how Satan works. He'll use you to do his bidding, his destructive work. But when you need him, no, he'll leave you there to die. Guys, And good thing David was hospitable to this guy because he ends up helping them. All right. He says, We made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judith and Judah and upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. Yeah, he did it. He was one of the ones that did it. And David said unto him, Can thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by, by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master. And I will bring thee down to this company. He's like, hey, you swear to God to me, you won't hand me back over to those Amalekites that left me out here to die. But this is one of the guys that burnt his community. But they treated, they, they revived him. He was out there dying. Remember this. You remember you, you uh, bless your, you know, bless your enemies. Pray for those that curse you. Get it? Because it's all going to get turned around with the power of God. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. Look, they didn't discriminate. They didn't just go against Judah. No, they were doing it to even the Philistines. You know, that's what, da that's what where David, David slew.